we have a very diversified business model. Um, our technology platform is incredibly versatile. It allows us to, to build products that are um, as simple as high performance first aid or can deal with as challenging and complicated um, a scenario as a, as a severe military or traumatic injury. Um, our, our materials and our platform have been clinically proven. I'm gonna show you some of that data today. Um, and then more kind of from the business side, um, our, our products are partnered. Uh, we have a first uh, executed partnership with the uh, uh, large, with the market leader and the largest manufacturer and distributor of uh, first aid and over-the-counter products uh, in North America, and they are adding our materials uh, uh, to their offering. And we'll talk in great deal of, uh, detail about that. So I'd like to start off with just giving you kind of a sense of how our products work. So what you see here is a benchtop demonstration where we're mixing commonly used materials with highly anticoagulated human blood. So we've heparinized the blood to make it very hard to clot. And as you can see here on the left, as we mix these biopolymers and cellulose and even fibrin, which is what your body uses to stop bleeding, those materials start to get thicker and the, and the environment starts to become more um, capable of, of uh, supporting a, an integral clot. But what you see there on the far right is the power of our technology. We almost instantaneously, instantaneously create a seal um, in that test tube, allowing us to actually hold the weight of the blood on the other side of that seal upon the vial inversion. So um, obviously this is pretty neat and it, and it shows you kind of how our product works, uh, but indeed this is just a, a benchtop uh, a demonstration and none of us, you know, kind of bleed in a test tube. Um, what you're gonna see here is what we do far more routinely. So this is a typical uh, surgical uh, model that we work on. This is actually one that's preferred by the FDA um, where you make an incision and a pretty reasonable injury in the liver of a, uh, of a pig. So what you've seen there is uh, us putting one of our lead uh, candidates into this liver incision. And so what's really interesting about this and what the take home is, is um, what you see here is a, an injury that's about an inch by an inch by about a third to a half an inch deep. And once we make that injury, those uh, patients are bleeding, not just from the top, they're bleeding from the bottom, from the sides, even from the incisions uh, along the top vascular level. So what we put in there is a, um, a clear, transparent, non-swelling material so that the surgeon can actually see through our material. You can actually see why it's a little darker red. That's because the fibrinogen and thrombin are creating a nice integral clot underneath our material. But it also shows you that we can stop bleeding not just in one plane, but in a variety of different geometries. And that's really important because as you can imagine, surgery just doesn't happen on a two-dimensional flat surface. It happens in a three-dimensional world. So um, again, interesting to move from a benchtop uh, model to a, to a well-established pig model. But now I'd like to show you um, some results from a human clinical study. So uh, one of our um, FDA cleared products or FDA approved products is a small bandage that's used after routine angiography. So um, you or maybe somebody you know has gone in to have either a diagnostic workup on their heart or has had to have a stent implanted. And in those cases, uh, an interventional cardiologist is going to enter quite often the radial artery in your wrist, and they're gonna use your radial artery as a highway to your heart. And they're gonna put some gear in there, they're gonna do some work, and then at the end of that procedure, they're gonna remove the gear. Um, in order to ensure that you don't have a stroke during that procedure, they give you a large amount of anticoagulant, um, heparin, very, very similar to what you saw in that earlier uh, example, so that you don't have a massive clot during that procedure and have a stroke or a heart attack. Um, now, because you've anticoagulated these patients and you have a pretty big hole in your artery, the current standard of care takes about two hours of post-procedural uh, surveillance for uh, a product to stop you from bleeding. And currently those products all work under a very simple uh, process, which is compression. So you put something around your wrist, you squeeze down on your wrist pretty tightly for two hours, and if you do, you can create a good integral clot. I can ambulate that patient and send them home. 
what we saw at the University of Chicago in the first 50 patients that we treated was that our median time to uh, hemostasis was about a third of the, of the current standard of care. So we reduced this by uh, well more than an hour and we're able to get these patients up, ambulated and discharged much more rapidly than they would have been using of the, the current wristband. What we also saw, which is maybe as interesting, is we had really great outcomes. None of these patients had a re-bleeding event or readmission, even though we stopped their bleeding in a much more uh, uh, rapid time frame. We had no occlusions, meaning we didn't create um, our material didn't get down into the artery and create a, a stoppage of blood flow from the um, arm to the to the hand. Uh, no cutaneous discomfort, so no inflammation, no rashes, no dis, no. All of the patients uh, reported really no issues whatsoever, um, and then no clinical grade hematomas. Uh, quite often, when you do this, there's some bleeding underneath the skin, and so even though you get a, a, a finally get a seal, you'll end up with a pretty large bruise on your forearm, even up into your upper arm. We saw nothing like that, and indeed, after our procedure and before our procedure, we did ultrasound so that we could make sure that we saw really good blood flow through that wrist down into the hand. So now that's really kind of cool stuff when you consider it from the clinical perspective, but you know, now kind of switching over to running our business, why does this matter? Well, all of these interventional cardiologies um, clinics run on pretty fixed set of costs. And if you can reduce the time to hemostasis, you can now do more procedures per day. If you can do more procedures per day at a similar fixed cost, you not only increase the revenue potential of your clinic, but you also improve your operating income. And so what we see here is an opportunity by adding a, a very small uh, material to the end of the process, that by using the power of our technology, we can get more patients up, out, and home more rapidly, allowing interventional cardiologists to do more procedures a day. We also think that um, generally there's about 10% of patients who have some kind of adverse event. Again, we had 0%. Um, at that low percentage rate, we also believe we're gonna have more satisfied patients. More satisfied patients means people who write better healthcare reports to their doctors. Um, and we all have started to work, you know, live in the world of Yelp and other similar um, uh, websites where you decide to do things based on feedback from other past patients or users of that business. No different in healthcare. So what we can provide the business of an interventional cardiology uh, a lab is greater productivity and happier patients, and we think more patients that want to come into their front door so that they can service them, giving them competitive advantages in their regional area. So. Um, I think I'll take a, a quick stop there and see, uh, looks like we're good on Q&A. Um, so now I'm going to kind of bridge into, we've showed you what the technology is like, we've showed you how it works. Now let's talk um, a little bit more about our business and, you know, how we're building it. Um, we've spent a lot of time working with the US FDA for external and topical applications meaning that you're taking our materials and you're putting them on top of an, a, a wound or a surgical incision so that it can uh, stop bleeding and you can treat that wound more effectively. We did that because in working with the FDA and going through that process, we can repeatedly show them that our products are safe and effective for routine cuts and scrapes, safe and effective for now clinical um, products. And we're working very hard towards providing them with now additional information for using this for internal military and surgical applications. And we're going to talk a, a fair bit today about the markets for military and especially for surgical products. And you'll see why it matters that we're moving into those large and frankly, much more lucrative markets. So um, to date, we already have FDA clearance uh, to market and sell products for uh, routine first aid. Um, this is the local management of bleeding. Um, we've also uh, convinced the uh, uh, US FDA to give us claims for antibacterial barriers and for the non-sterile preparation of our materials. So essentially, the FDA has decided that our products are really good at stopping bleeding, 
can actually um, help uh, reduce the amount of um, infection in those wounds and that our materials are so inert that we don't even need to sterilize them prior, prior to um, um, shipping them off to places like CVS. We've also shown the FDA that we can manage a broad spectrum of wounds and even first degree burns. And so all of those claims come to um, developing our consumer products business, which I'm gonna show you here in a second. Um, in addition, we've also uh, gotten a clearance for a first bandage for um, clinical use. I just showed you the data from the work at the University of Chicago. And so now we've expanded out our platform to not only treat more routine uh, cut scrapes and the like that you do that you treat with first aid, but now also much more involved arterial bleeds um, from a clinical um, procedure. So now when we move to how are we building our business, we're building it from the bottom up. So the foundation that we're creating from our first aid and OTC business has value not just for that business, but it has value for our clinical business, our military business, and our surgical business as well. So we started on the OTC front. One, it's a, it's a very large worldwide market. Um, the North American market in particular is about a billion dollars is spent every year on first aid and wound treatment products. Um, and we worked very hard to find a partner and to sign a partnership with um, the North American market leader in uh, providing, manufacturing, and distributing these kind of products. Um, uh, this group, uh, Asso Medical, out of Sarasota, Florida, makes and sells about four billion Band-Aids a year. Um, and with their help, we're gonna have our first product on the shelf, uh, most likely uh, with CVS leading the way um, in early 2021. Uh, we've already decided on multiple SKUs for independent markets. So not just for retail pharmacies and big box stores like Walmart, but also to attack the industrial first aid market. Uh, and the reason for doing that is that our materials have advantages in for companies like Cintas as they make hundreds of thousands of new first aid kits a year and providing a single use product in those kits. Uh, we're also fortunate that this partner is supporting our manufacturing scale up. So they're helping, they've helped us uh, be able to afford to move into our brand new corporate HQ. And um, we're actually doing a uh, press release tomorrow about that. So if you check back on your website, you can actually see some pictures of our new manufacturing space. Um, but they also have opportunities to expand out the consumer business. So not just the, the SKUs and the products we're starting with, but also um, providing more products to a broader set of potential channel partners. So, Larry, Larry yeah. if you don't mind, it was super instructive to me when I asked the question because I was puzzled, but it wasn't because I knew what I was talking about. I was just, it was novel to me that, while well, we use that word too often now, to see a company like yours starting in the consumer product, but you have a strategy and I know you might be getting to it, but I'm either going to remind you to get to it or talk. To, I thought it was really interesting and, and smart the way you were going about it. Yeah, and so that, that's, a, that's a great point, Art. And so um, really, this slide's a good example of, the, of what Art's talking about. This strategy is foundational. So this same core capability that we're going to use for over-the-counter products, that same core manufacturing capability allows us to then layer on top vascular closure, military products, and surgical products. Indeed, the first product that we're bringing to market is a um, transparent hydrogel, which, just like what I showed you before, is a very similar kind of product that we're going to bring to market for our first surgical product. So by doing this, we do two important things. One, we get the FDA um, confident that our core platform is safe and effective for first aid, safe and effective for vascular closure, safe and effective for military and trauma, and safe and effective for surgical. That same platform, that same foundational manufacturing piece allows us to make our active ingredient for, you know, first over-the-counter gels, then Band-Aids, then uh, uh, vascular closure sponges, and eventually surgical foams and, uh, and surgical gels. So as I, I was mentioning, our, our first product to market, um, and probably the first place you'll see it will be at CVS. Um, I will stress that this is just a conceptual markup at the moment. 
We're still working with both CVS and our partner on what the box art and what the tube art is gonna look like. Uh, but regardless, this will be the first product on the market that has both an advanced hemostatic claim as well as an antibacterial label. This is really important because the market research that our partner and their partners have been doing over the last four or five years suggests that this kind of product is something that the market really is looking for. They're looking for something that is a combination of a high performance Band-Aid plus Neosporin all wrapped up into one. And so although we're entering the market in a, with a highly differentiated product, um, of being a, a hydrogel, what we all are looking for is not only expanding out the partners that will sell this product, but also moving to coated bandages and coated band-aids. We all know that a lot of the, and almost all of the first aid that's provided in this country eventually uses a band-aid, not always to stop the bleeding, but certainly to cover the wound afterwards. We believe that we can provide these coated band-aids and indeed, if we can just convert even a percentage of, of ASO's 4 billion Band-Aids a year, even at a fraction of a penny per Band-Aid, there's a significant revenue and a margin opportunity for us just in consumer products. Um, but our raises a good point. The reason we're starting with consumer products is because we have the right partner. This would be something to be very hard for a small company to do alone, but our partner saw the results from that University of Chicago study. They've seen a lot of the other results we've provided. And what they see is something that is truly novel and truly kind of first to the world in terms of a product like this. And so the ability to have a whole consumer business and then certainly to be able to start with a, such a differentiated product puts us on really great footing to now think about other bigger, more lucrative markets. So now if we switch from kind of uh, a uh, kind of first aid to the other end of the spectrum and looking at surgical products. So in surgery, uh, and let's just look at the, the market in the United States. Um, the, the United States market for surgery is one, $1 billion, as you see growing there by two to 4% cage or a year. But the center of that marketplace and the most lucrative part of that marketplace are flowable products. And when you think of the word flowable, it's just exactly, it's something that you can squeeze out of a syringe, something that's liquid, something that you can put into um, um, a, a patient and very precisely uh, be able to provide the product to the site of bleeding. Um, what's really important in this marketplace is all of the current products, in order for them to work well, they use that product fibrin that we showed you earlier. And fibrin's a great product. It's a, it's a human protein. It's actually extracted from human or animal blood to make it work. The problem with fibrin is that it's expensive and it requires special handling conditions in order to get it into a position to allow it to be used in surgery. So we think and we, we're very confident that we can provide a highly differentiated product. So much so, or, or, and really the basis for that, is a very in-depth uh, a set of market research we've done over the last year to 18 months. Um, very recently, uh, some guys who are uh, used to run uh, Baxter, uh, Baxter's biosurgery sales forces, um, also worked for J&J, &J. they did this study for us. And what they told us going in is, you really need to see a six or higher in the willingness to trial or the willingness to use a product in order for these big companies to kind of take something like this and look at it as a, as a product that they might integrate into their product portfolio. Uh, what you can see is in across multiple different categories, our average scores for these were about, um, we were almost eight for a, a gel and just over seven for a foam. So we chose a gel for those reasons, but we think that there's an opportunity to actually build a series of surgical products um, for this marketplace. So we've gone ahead and we bought, we've made our first gel-based product. Uh, we've, we've developed a product intentionally that has, is transparent, um, has little or no swell upon delivery, um, can adhere itself to vertical surfaces, has no prep time, um, has a variability in its viscosity so that we can use it through a syringe or even push it down through a trocar for endoscopic or laparoscopic surgery. Um, and also a product that's antibacterial. Um, and we've now taken that 
that product and we've repeatedly tested it. We've tested it in preclinical models like the, the first one I showed you. We've done 13 week rabbit implantation studies. We've done one in six week controlled survival studies where we leave a human dose of our material in actually small animals. Um, and then of course, we've taken this same format through US FDA clearance for external lab, um, applications and now we're just moving to um, internal use of those. And so um, to give you now, when we look at a product that um, is our kind of our lead surgical candidate, um, this is an even more aggressive bleeding model. Um, we go into the very uh, vascular part of the, of the porcine liver. Uh, this is where there's a lot of um, uh, blood flow, which is necessary to make the liver work well. Um, after just suctioning out a little bit of the first uh, blood, we put um, about five mils of our material in here. Um, notice that we're only gonna compress for three minutes. That's on the low end of the scale that the FDA uses to determine whether a product can uh, be marketed. And here you see in just three minutes, we've uh, achieved complete hemostasis. Um, indeed, even in this very, very uh, challenging bleeding environment. Um, what else is really important about our products are that they're pretty durable. Uh, what you can see here is that we can actually sew through the material without removing it. That's really important because every surgeon is going to want to eventually, they're not just going to leave our material in there and let it close on its own. They're going to close that up as they do normally. And so we, what we've seen is that material is degradable enough to leave in there and again, be kind of sewn through. So <clears throat> when you now think of how we're going to be differentiated, I think you have to look at the broader uh, marketplace. And what that really is, is looking at what's, what's available today. Um, there are a number of fairly simple products that are mechanical in nature. So everything from cautery to, to you know, used, they used to use uh, calf gut to, uh, to sew with. Um, these products work, they work okay. They certainly stop bleeding. They don't stop bleeding super fast, but they do a reasonable job of it. But in the end, they're, they're fairly inexpensive. But as the time and the expense of a time in the OR has increased, then so has innovation in the OR. And so over the last 15 years, a series of products have been brought to market, which are all kind of flowable or liquid in nature. They're much better at handling more intense bleeds. Um, they're much more rapid in their ability to clot. Um, they don't swell, and in some cases, they can be used in minimally invasive surgery. The downside of these products is that they require a lot of prep time, and they require anticipation to use. So if you want to use one of these products, you either have to take it out of the freezer, or you have to take it and get your scrub nurse to actually prep some prior to actually starting the surgery, so that indeed, if you need it, you can use it. We already know that we can make products that work just as good, if not potentially better than these. We know that we can provide products that have the kind of viscosity that we can easily use them in non-invasive surgeries. Um, moreover, our products are rip and go. There's no prep time. You can keep our product in the transportation packaging and then literally moments before you need it, you can take it, open it up, take the syringe out and begin using it. But really, as important as that will be to drive adoption by surgeons, what we also are gonna provide is an incredible value to the, uh, to the hospital. Um, we believe that we can provide a, uh, a unit dose that is twice as large as the current dose for less money than what they're paying for for their current dose. So we're not only providing a lot more material, so instead of buying two doses that are each, let's say 150 to $160. So spending 300 to $320 per surgery, we believe we can uh, provide products that <clears throat> can sell for 125 to $130 per surgery, and that can provide us still with a 90 plus percent margin. Um, indeed, the guys that did that work for us um, on the uh, voice of the customer, they also did a, uh, uh, their own uh, independent uh, revenue and sales forecast. 
and they determined that peak sales of just our first product could reach $185 million a few years after um, initial uh, market launch. So not only are these products high margin, but they're high value. And they really look a lot like some of the spec pharma products you might see from other biotech companies, except this is a product that we can put in the market in a few years and not spend $100 million in its development. So just on a, on a straight up business basis, what you see here is the ability for us to build a business on products that, that have you know, large volumes, large market opportunities like for over the counter and consumer, but then layer on top of them these really, really lucrative products, which if you, if you now go to what's happened in the past, that is what has driven M&A interest in um, these type of, of products. So I think uh, before I, I jump into um, uh, kind of the use of funds, I'll stop there for a moment and see if uh, there are any questions. Hey folks, you're so welcome to, uh, actually, if you wanted to jump in anytime, you can just hold up your hand and I can actually take your uh, mute off if you care to ask one or as answer it or ask it in the Q&A or the chat box. So uh, you, you can proceed there, Larry. Sounds great. So uh, now let's talk a little bit about the financing, the use of funds um, and, uh, and the like. So uh, on, we're a very, very capitally efficient company. Um, we've actually developed uh, our OTC product to the point where it is today, um, received those FDA clearances, built our intellectual property portfolio and put our team together on less than $3 million worth of investors capital. Um, now, we've also been the beneficiary of almost, the same, actually more than that in non-dilutive capital, so a little over $3 million in non-dilutive capital. Um, and indeed, that, that, some of that non-dilutive capital has allowed us to start our military program that's being supported by the Department of Defense. And uh, recently, we had an interim analysis uh, call with them, and they pushed us pretty hard to start uh, submitting additional grants that will support the clinical evaluation of the product because they were so impressed with the results. So we're already working on a second set of grants that will be probably two to three times as large as the, as the current grant we have from the Department of Defense. Uh, but as I said, we're raising five and a half million dollars and we're really using it for three important uh, uh, projects. One, to get our first product in the market to CVS and start creating sales um, we will actually generate revenues in late 2020, and then there will be actual commercial sales early in Q1 2021. Uh, but as I mentioned, you know, we're a little bit greedy. We want to expand out from not just the first uh, wound gel product, but to also start to be able to uh, expand into adhesive bandages and band-aids. Um, well, Larry, yep. one second, because uh, you touched on it, but could you clear up? We have my, my friend Rosario asked a question about whether you got grants from the military and I think in a fashion you have, but could you just talk a little bit more about that? Yes, so um, the, we've started working with the US military on a pretty interesting project for internal non-compressible hemorrhage. Um, in fact, that project has already received breakthrough designation from the FDA for accelerated review. Um, but really the largest cause of death in combat is because of uh, our, our, our soldiers, um, unfortunately, bleeding out, having an internal bleed that can't be stopped. We're developing an um, internal expandable foam, and in fact, um, we're going to be able to be able to publish the interim results of that here in the next few days. Um, that, was, that program was really supported in whole so far by a grant from the Department of Defense, uh, and again, the, uh, our recent discussion with them where we went through these interim results led them to suggest that we should actually start um, expanding out on our original grants, submit some new grants, because stopping internal non-compressible hemorrhage is a, is a huge um, upside for the military because we, could, we might be able to reduce the number of deaths 
by 30 or 40 percent just by being able to provide a product like this um, to the the medics that are in theater. So I, Rosario, I hope that uh, um, answered your question. Um, I think so. Um, so a little bit kind of back to, so again, starting first sales. Uh, second thing will be getting a partnership uh, in place for our first uh, um, clinical device, the one that was used in that study at the University of Chicago. Um, but finally, and, and really when we think about future uh, uh, valuation leverage, um, finishing all of the animal studies that are necessary to uh, get the US FDA to approve um, us moving into a clinical trial. Uh, so we would then uh, imagine a, a uh, the next financing and very likely the last financing this company would do would be to support that single clinical study necessary to support that $185 million a year product that I, that I showed you earlier. Um, the reason for doing that and the reason we're willing to dilute ourselves and even to think about raising more money to do this is the value inflections associated with that kind of product. So in fact, I'm going to jump ahead a little bit and talk about valuation, and then we can come back and talk a little bit about the round. So when we think about our company, we think about creating value in our company, um, we do so in, in, you know, on the basis of how have others created value in similar companies. So as a series of, of comps to us, if you look at our 2019 revenues of about half a million dollars, we look a lot like a company called Arch Therapeutics. Um, their ticker symbol is A-R-T-H. They're a pre-revenue publicly traded company developing a surgical hemostat. And their market cap, even, even over the last 60 days, um, has been anywhere between 30 and $40 million. Um, if you now kind of start to fast forward into 2020, where we start to see our you know, kind of some of those first revenues from our consumer business. Um, we look a lot more like a company called Closure Medical. And indeed, one of our board members, Jim Buck, ran commercial operations at Closure Medical. Um, Closure had a market cap of about $160 million. When they had sales, about a million and a half, they were eventually purchased by Ethicon J&J &J for almost $400 million. Um, if you then move into what we see happening in 2021 and 2022, um, our consumer products starting to grow in their sales, and now a, our first clinical product, our vascular closure product coming to market, we look a lot like a company called Metaphor, which was sold to CR Bard for about $300 million. And then if you look at the time in 2023 when uh, our underlying products have gotten us to the point of being cash flow positive, we now can layer on top of those um, sales from our surgical product and we look very much like a company called Omrix that was purchased by Ethicon J&J &J for almost $500 million. So as you build these, these businesses and as you build in these more lucrative products, valuation comes along with it. Indeed, some very recent comps, um, uh, Baxter just bought uh, two surgical uh, uh, hemostatic products, Prevalik and Ricothrom from Malincrot for 10 times annual revenues. Um, they just did it again about six months ago where they bought a product from Sanofi, which is another internal surgical uh, uh, material for uh, over 10 times revenues at $350 million. So we know that not only the his these historical comps continue to play out, and I think really driven by the market size and the uh, margins that are available on these products because of their value to, um, to surgery. So um, I think I'll pause there for a moment before uh, we move in and talk a little bit more about this particular financing. Well, one of the things that I wanted to make sure you touch on, if you don't mind, before, you know, we're, we're 15 minutes left in this, um, is, and I'm gonna say it sarcastically, and, <laughs> You know, what makes you think you and your team can deliver this type of value to the marketplace 
and I happen to know the answer to that, but I think it's really instructive to share that with the group. Yeah, I, it's a great, you know, I should take you on the road with me, Art. Um, it's twofold, right? It's a mixture of, of technology and people. So you've seen a lot of the technology, you can understand why it would be so disruptive and so differentiated, but it's really the people that create the opportunity. Um, so we've been able to, and we've, we've really had both great fortune, and I think because of the technology and the opportunity here have been able to draw people to our story, we've brought in the kind of people that we need to. Um, uh, Rich Vincent's been my CFO now at a couple of different companies. Uh, Rich is from San Diego, but he was the life science CFO of the year from San Diego, which is no mean feat a few years ago. Um, Rich has raised public money, private money, uh, uh, done a lot of therapeutic and other deals. Um, and so again, uh, both a close personal friend and a, and a great partner. Um, Matt Dowling, uh, Matt uh, uh, is the core technical founder uh, Matt's really kind of a, a undergrad, Notre Dame, uh, uh, was a uh, PhD fellow at the University of Maryland when he developed this, and really is kind of the guiding technical um, uh, source for us to be able to make these great products. But on top of that, we've layered people like Bruce Choi, who set up uh, manufacturing recently for a company called Sapion, which is an advanced uh, uh, materials company just like us. Um, Elsa Abruzzo took CryoLife through uh, uh, CryoLife's BioGlue product through a, an FDA clearance process. Um, we've added a great board. Alex Arrow is a former uh, Lazard banker, has had been a C level uh, um, uh, um, CFO, CEO of a number of different vascular closure companies. And Jim Buck ran commercial operations at Closure, which was one of the, uh, the exits we talked about. Um, Ed Quilty was the one who introduced us to our consumer products um, uh, partner. Ed is former chairman and CEO of, of uh, Derma Sciences, one of the largest uh, novel wound care publicly traded companies in the world. And then we also have people like Tanea Meters and Felix Vega. Felix was who, the one who developed Flow Seal, which is still the largest selling flowable surgical hemostat in the world while he was at Fusion Medical. And then he went on to re run um, R&D at Baxter Biosurgery. And then, of course, we've got some great clinicians on the team. Um, all of these guys have worked in developing uh, medical devices, in particular surgical hemostats. Um, they're everywhere from trauma surgery to Dr. Joel Buzzy, who's the medical director of the Winter X Games. So it's the team coupled with the technology, coupled with the opportunity, and our, and our plan and our strategy, which makes us confident that we can execute on this and have done so in a very, very capitally efficient manner to date. Um, right, now, hang on, you just and don't be modest. Tell them about what you've done. Um, so, uh, well, Art and I talked about this a little bit before. So, uh, let's see, um, um, undergrad degree in biochemistry, um, a master's from Hopkins in biotechnology. I'm also, although I am on a 12-step program, um, I'm a registered patent attorney, but I've, I've been the commercial guy um, and or the CEO now of a series of startup companies. I've, um, I've worked for a company that was one of the uh, initial leaders in the genomic revolution. I was there when uh, I wasn't the CEO of that company, but I was on the senior team that did the initial IPO, eventually went on to raise $275 million on the secondary IPO. Um, while I was there, I ran worldwide um, sales and marketing. I was general manager of a division, and I helped that company uh, close deals that generated over three hundred million dollars in revenues. Um, so I've been kind of the commercial guy on these teams, and um, but I'm just so fortunate to work with some of the smartest uh, people that you saw there on my team. Um, and then I'd say the one other thing, Art, that's worth a discussion about that has helped us. Um, raise money in this company and be so successful in using it so efficiently is a program that's available and it's available in this financing through the uh, state of Maryland. So um, the state of Maryland runs a program every year. Um, if you're a qualified Maryland biotech company, which we have been for the last five years, um, investments up to $500,000, we can support an application to this program for you where you can receive 50% of your investment back 
in cash. So half of your money, so if you put in half a million dollars, you would get $250,000 back in cash. Um, and indeed, we've been pretty successful in this. We've returned over $3 million to our current investors using this program. Um, we've also gotten better at the program and smarter. The program's also gotten more rigorous. It's, it's now harder to qualify. And we've been fortunate that between our own qualifications and those of our, our investors, that we've been able to get a lot of people over the line. So how it works is pretty simple. Uh, you'd make an investment in a convertible note in uh, April or very early May of this year. Um, we will help you then um, in June submit a very simple application to the Department of Commerce in the state of Maryland. Um, they will then uh, send you a, a password and a, a, a username and very precisely on July 1st, you will get online, you will enter these things into a website and you will get into an electronic queue. Um, during the preceding uh, three or four months, the Department of Commerce will work down through that queue and they will send investors tax credit awards. We will then help you convert your note into preferred Series A equity on a fixed set of terms and a fixed valuation um, to allow you to then get your final tax credit award. Now this part's a, it's a little strange, but I can tell you it works and it works perfectly. You will then submit a tax return to the state of Maryland. For most of our investors, they're not Maryland uh, residents. They don't owe any Maryland tax liability. So actually the tax returns are pretty simple to, to fill out. You have a bunch of zeros. At the very end, you'll have your credit. Your credit, again, if you put in half a million dollars and your credit was $250,000, your credit then becomes your refund and you will literally get a check back from the Comptroller of Maryland for $250,000. And so um, I would, a couple things I wanna say, um, you do not have to do this. We're happy to sell you a, a Series A preferred equity um, at, the, on this, at the same closing. But I would say I've put money in the company. I've taken advantage of this uh, program. Others have done so. It is well worth the small amount of effort for you. It's a larger amount of effort for me and my team. But even for us, well worth it to be able to dramatically risk reduce this investment for our um, new and our current investors. So um, there's more to this. I'm happy to go through the some of the details if people want, but this is exactly how it works and we've done it repeatedly. We have the team that's in place that can do it again for you. So I won't make Larry say this, but uh, the reason is pretty obvious that why Maryland's doing in this is because it's a Maryland based company and it employs people and it creates revenue, et cetera, et cetera. So that's obvious. What is not so obvious is the reason why all of the investors who filed for it didn't get it back. And because um, I, I dug deep on this with Larry, part of it was that someone just didn't do the form in time. The other one just said, forget it. And so the, I'm not suggesting or saying in the place of Larry that you're for sure going to get it because there's things you need to do. Um, but uh, there, the, the evidence is that if you do your, uh, what it's designed to do, then you're likely to get your money back unless you just totally blow it off or they run out of money, which is also possible. Yeah, our, our spot on. Um, we've, we've gotten smarter at this program. I've just hired um, about three months ago, a new office manager as we moved into our brand new uh, purpose-built manufacturing facility. Um, and uh, she's former paralegal. She's worked for me in the past as well. And now with her on board, um, the administeria behind this program becomes you know, much more, you know, manageable for us. So uh, happy to answer any other questions you have. Uh, there, something that Mr. Harrington also always asks me to remind people of, we have a data room that's available to people. Um, we're happy to answer individual questions. Um, what I would say is think very hard about this. If you're interested, it is worth you spending the time, and I know hopefully maybe some people have a little bit of extra time 
uh, given the current isolation over the next few weeks. <laughs> if you can dig into this deeply and make a decision quickly, it is well worth your time to do that. Um, that said, I, I don't want anyone to feel like they're getting jammed on this investment. We're happy to sell you Series A preferred shares, um, um, assuming that the round doesn't fill up between now and then. Um, but if you find this of interest, I would highly recommend putting some effort in and seeing if you can get comfortable with this soon because it is, it's, it's well worth your while. What, what's the reasonable date for which this doesn't become practical to deploy capital as an investor for this program? Um, we really, uh, we've set the, our, our planned closing date for the note is May 1st. Um, look, I, if that, if somebody told me that they had to get in and they couldn't get the money in by that Friday and they needed until the, you know, the following Monday or so, but really it needs to be in those first few days of May. And the reason for that is, um, again, th this is my pain, not the investors, but the company has to put a very in-depth application together to the state. Um, that's due usually around uh, May 15th and having all of these materials locked and loaded so that we can make that part of our application um, is really critical in the success of this program. So it's a, it's a fairly short fuse, um, but I think you'll see this is a very well put together company and the opportunity here, I hope I showed you today is, is pretty significant. So I, I'm annoyed often with the, the press and others uh, saying that, oh, that was a good question. But Rosario actually has a very good question. Um, if Maryland runs out of the funds for this year, will you be able to apply next year? And could you restate in who is your manufacturing company? So two questions. Sure. Um, so uh, the answer for Rosario is, is um, there's a year, you can't reapply year on year. So we get kind of, basically we're prepping for the, what they call the 2020 program. Uh, the state of Maryland starts their fiscal year on July 1st. That's, that's why all this is kind of got this weird date. Um, so this is kind of a one shot, uh, one time, one shot deal at the moment at least for the program. Um, uh, future investments uh, may have some other advantages. The, the downside of the program is you need to enter, you, you need to go through this process of putting money into a company and sitting in a convertible note or other vehicle. I, I really wish the way it worked was I could just sell you equity and then allow you to apply for a credit based on that equity. Once we convert your investment into equity or are no longer eligible for the program, it's, it's just the way the program works. I, I wish it was different. But so it's important to get in the note, to get in this, this loop um, while, the, while the opportunity is here um, relative to the, to the Series A uh, funding. Um, on the manufacturing side, uh, that's an interesting question. We actually have for almost every product, and I'll, I'll pull up an example just so you can see them here again. You know, when you look at, at a slide like this one, so what we do in our shop, and actually I have a better slide to show you, what we do in our shop is the following. We buy natural, natural polysaccharides, we buy natural fatty acids, we do the chemistry to graft into the backbone so we can make this core new hemostatic biomaterial. That turns out to be a powder as an end result. And then we work with other already well-established FDA audited companies to make bandages, gels, foams, putties, and coatings. So for our first product and for our, our first uh, uh, um, consumer uh, uh, indication, we will ship our powder to a group actually just outside of Princeton, New Jersey. They will take the powder, they make it into a gel, they will uh, put the gel into tubes and they can do that in a very, very high throughput manner. So they can do 10,000, they can make 10,000 tubes in a day. Um, then for our consumer products, we ship those to our, our partner in, in Sarasota. They do all of the secondary and tertiary uh, packaging. 
they ship it to uh, the the uh, uh, district uh, the distribution centers for places like CVS. They manage all the POS systems, all the inventory control, and then we have a single uh, source, a single uh, for uh, making additional orders. Um, however, for a surgical product, we may get a different CMO that we would send them the powder. They would do sterile filtration and put it into syringes. So our, we, we've got this really nice bifurcated process that allows us to do what we do really well and then lean on well-established CMOs to do what they do routinely and very, very cost-effectively. I, I thought that uh, the question was different and it was my interpretation, so I apologize, but I think also what Rosario is thinking about is the distributor the name of the distributor that you're, that does all the Band-Aids? Yes, so that's Asso Medical from Sarasota, Florida. Um, so Asso, they have a couple of things that they do really well. They make and sell a lot of Band-Aids, but they also have contracts in place with all of those folks like CVS. <clears throat> they, they've got customer support. They've got uh, a whole team that does artwork. They have people that do you know high throughput packaging. So we're leveraging all of those capabilities that ASO has. So connection to the market, ability to manage inventory, they're actually carrying all the inventory risk that we, when we make, when they order from us and we ship to them, we get paid, regardless of what happens in that inventory on the other side. Um, and they have a really broad uh, reach into, the, into all these different channel partners. Larry, could we revisit the uh, valuation and raise? Sure. Uh, we have a guest that uh, missed that. Sure. And uh, so um, the, this is some core financial information for all of you. Uh, end of the year with a little over two million bucks in the bank. Um, that uh, although at the end of the year we had about one point two million dollars in convertible debt, that's now down to about half a million. That's why when we say our round is 5.5 million half a million of that is debt that will convert into the round five million of it is new money so when you look at the uh, series a terms uh it's a 25 million dollar uh, pre-money again aligned to some of those comps that we showed you in the past um the series a investors will uh have board representation as a class uh you have the series a investors will have pro rata rates um to invest in future rounds and of course, you will have both a preferred uh, return on capital in terms of uh, liquidation, as well as any uh, disbursements that might be made. So your principal will be paid back first, and then any other preferreds or, um, or uh, others. Great. Uh, any other questions from anybody before we wrap things up here? It's 3.15. There's I I, I, I do see a question from Storm. It says, on the military side, to what extent is MedCare competing with Quick Clot or Cellox? Uh, great question. Um, indeed, the guys that made Cellox, uh, we use their products as predicate devices in our regulatory submissions, so we're very, very familiar with them. Um, uh, they're mostly external uh, and kind of more bandage associated uh, products. Uh, the product we're working on with the military is for internal use and the active ingredient in, in combat gauze and cellox is a product called kaolin. So kaolin is actually a mineral that's literally, it's, it's mined. Um, and so although it does a really good job of absorbing blood and so like a combat gauze, when you push it down on a wound, it does a really good job of soaking up blood um, and helping that wound to create a, a seal. Um, it'll never be used internally because kaolin is not, a, it, it is not a core active ingredient that could ever be left inside the body or frankly get too close to being inside the body. So it's a, it's a fairly different application. Um, but what also is pretty interesting is that uh, um, when you look at um, the, uh, the applications of our external foam product, uh, what we see are, are products that are actually 
um, uh, potentially higher performance than even the combat gauze or the cell locks. So for external, we think we're differentiating our performance, but they actually can't make a product that's um, that can be used internally, at least not with that same material. Larry, do you see that? Uh, I'll, I'll, uh, the trauma is critical and the number one priority for the Army as the Army offered you a contingent contract. Yeah, great question. You know, for us, trauma is interesting. And I, you know, uh, Mr. Harrington and I have had this discussion over a couple of different dinners. Um, there's three things that we really like about trauma. And the first one may not be a reason to invest in the company, but collectively the guys in our company were pretty patriotic people. We, we, excuse me, we'd like to make a product um, that can save people's lives and, and we're working as hard as we can to do it. Now, supported by that military grant was important for us because not only does it carry some of the overhead of the company, but it also allowed us to make hundreds of different types of formulations of flowable products. Some of them, like the expandable foam we're using for the military applications, some like the transparent gel we're using for civilian applications. Um, and then last is kind of on the marketing side, being able to say that, you know, you can make a product that are used by Navy SEALs or by Green Berets or that save the lives of, of even one person in combat is a pretty great testimonial to how great the technology works. Um, now, I would tell you the, the flip side on the business and to answer your car question directly, Art, we do not have a contingent um, agreement from the military to buy this product. Uh, I can tell you from every discussion we've had with them, it would shock me if we get this product FDA cleared that they wouldn't buy it. Um, but to be fair, the trauma market is a little seasonal and it is not as large as say the human surgical market. So for us and what I tell investors and it's same for the money I put into this company is um, when it comes to trauma, if we can uh, continue to get non-dilutive funding to move those programs forward, we're absolutely going to do it. We will work the extra hours it takes to make that program work, um, but we will not saddle investors with the expense associated with that program, um, indeed, if we don't get additional funding, which frankly seems somewhat unlikely, but just to give you guys a sense of how we think about military products as it relate, as compared to surgical or other products we're, we're developing with investor funds. Great. Um, by the way, everybody, thanks for your engagement and thanks for being here. We have to wrap it up, uh, just being thoughtful of everybody's time. You're most welcome to uh, connect with Larry or John Harrington. Um, we'll be sending you um, and everybody the information presented here today. <clears throat> Actually, we won't, but Larry will. And we'll put Larry in touch with you. You're most welcome to, uh, to be in direct touch. Is that okay, Larry? Oh, absolutely. And uh, again, a super thank you for for giving us your time, which is the only thing we can't make more of. And uh, we're always grateful for the participation of the, the community. And Larry, that was really, really helpful. Um, and I want to pay homage to dearest John Harrington for, again, uh, exposing us and making us aware of this opportunity. And all of you, again, thank you for being here. Larry, thank you. Thanks, Art. Look forward to hearing from your group. And we're going to record this, so if anybody missed it, you want to share it with, we'll, we'll post it up. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, folks.